And I think Maggie, if you could start the recording. Okay, it is recording, I see that. So as chair of the Plant Conservation Alliance Federal Committee, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Thomas Easley, who has spent most of his career as a diversity professional and a forester. As a diversity professional, he has focused on the recruitment, retention, and diverse talent of in natural resource disciplines. As a forester, he has worked with landowners and citizens on land management and stewardship. Easley earned his undergraduate degree in forest science from Alabama A&M University, his master's degree in forest genetics from Iowa State University, and his doctorate in adult education from NC State University. Easley served as the D diversity director of the College of Natural Resources at NC State University, where he taught courses, advised students, and supported faculty and staff on programming, ensuring they are inclusive to all populations. Now, as the Assistant Dean of Community and Inclusion at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, he combines his professions along with his passions of art and ministry to lead the diversity efforts in the school. Without further ado, Dr. Easley, I hope you're able to grab the screen from me, speaking to us about the relationships, hip hop, history, hip hop, and forestry. Let's welcome Dr. Easley. I give you the floor. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, let me just check with you because I can still see you. Can you hear me clearly? It's a little quiet for me. So as long as you speak up. Okay, all right. Here's what he says, quiet, okay. All right, hold on, wait a minute, let me ask you this. What about now? That seems better. better. Got it. All right. Sorry, okay. Now cool. I'm back. All right. And then I'll get ready to share my screen. I just want to check in with you one last time before you leave, Patricia, before you go silent. Can you see the screen? Can you see the black yep, relationship? It looks perfect. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lita, for the a wonderful introduction and for having me here. Uh, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Thomas Rashad Easley here. The presentation that I'm about to take you through is entitled Relationships, History, Hip Hop, and Forestry. What I want to just encourage you all to, uh, to consider uh, as I'm getting ready to go into this is while hip hop is entertaining, which I know it is, I love hip hop, uh, it can also be educational. And, um, and as I am merging these different fields and ways of talking about it, I'm going to do my best to be engaging. Um, and uh, I've also been called at times entertaining, uh, but I also want to make sure that people understand that I am a, a scholar. So I'm also informing as well as educating in this talk. So with that, we'll get started. What is a leader? Who is a leader? You think it's you, you think it's me. What is a leader? Folk who believe you, believe what you say, pay you to speak. They think you're perfect. They want your life. Whenever they see you, they see you as true. When leaders, people run to you. They think you have answers. They want you to fix what is wrong. What is a leader? You get put on pedestals. People are helping you because you expose. Hey, do you because you get lots of attention. You have one partner, but they want your. Mm -hmm. Some so down on themselves, take bad treatment, lie to themselves on the low. Get mad at you because they played themselves looking for saviors. This world is so cold. You can have confidence, sound eloquent, look smooth, lie through your teeth. The whole campaign, you sell them something and they're going to buy it. Sounds like it's free. What is a leader? You know, you feel like, who am I? They want to be me. You know, you're making it up as you're going along and they're thinking you got to plan freeze. <laughs> when you're a leader, you learn by doing or get taught these lessons by the boss. You win position and all leaders know that love it ain't free, but it comes with a cost. If you're on top, they pray that you drop. And when you get hot and you take the shot, because if you wait, you let them take and they get your weight and that's when you lost. So I like starting off uh, this presentation with a rhyme of mine on a song that has not come out yet, but it will be out in a couple of weeks called What is a Leader? But the point of this really to show this is just to, this is not about bragging. It's not even me like saying I'm a leader, but I think that when people step out and into the forefront and people can now see you and you're exposed, you basically have a couple of of reactions that people can give you or a few, right? They can love what you're doing, they can tear it down, they can hate what you're doing, they can critique it, they can do all kinds of things. And, the, and what I've learned now, as I'm doing more of this work on an, on an international you know, scale, um, is that when you're talking and speaking to people, you know, even though you've been asked to do something, you, know, you still expose yourself. 
And so um, I wanted to start also with this rhyme is because uh, there's so many things that I've had to learn in life by doing, not learned in life by being able to read it and then going and then, you know, then, then being able to apply it. And so I've had to learn sometimes like in the moment. And, uh, and so I just want to encourage you all because I know that everyone here uh, is, is a leader and you're doing similar, if not the same thing, just in your career and, and stepping out. And I want you to understand that I do understand that, whether it's from a forestry perspective or whether it's from an educational perspective or for me at this moment from a hip hop perspective or from an art perspective. So uh, I've been working in diversity. Technically, I would kind of say I've been working in diversity for longer than 24 years. If I add when I started school, when I went and had my first job out of school and graduate school and a host of other experiences that I've had. But when I teach about diversity, um, I really try to make it easy for people to understand or to uh, take some of the take some of the knowledge that I'm sharing with them and really to apply it. So that's why I speak in what I would consider probably more of a simplistic tone instead of using, uh, you know, amazing vernacular and using all of the special terms uh, that, it, uh, that are out now. I try to speak in a way that people can get it immediately. So when doing diversity work, uh, in my opinion, you one thing you're doing is you're working on a relational level. OK, uh, many people, I, from my experience, see diversity or want to see diversity as this linear thing. Right. And that's whether we're in forestry, the environment, horticulture or education. But what I invite people to realize is that diversity is not linear. The, uh, the, uh, diversity is just like a relationship or an individual. It goes up and down. And so when you're doing this work in diversity, what you're really doing is you're influencing a person's ideology, thought pattern cultural understanding for the purposes of changing something. Now, some would say maybe changing the mindset, okay, which is why I put ideology back here again. And for some people, uh, if you're the one who needs that change, okay, then the mindset is going to be the most important thing to you. But for the per people or the person outside, the thing that's probably going to be most important to them is the behavior, right? Because that's what they can see. That's what they can also feel. So when doing this, doing uh, diversity work, I say that you're working relationally to hopefully change mindsets and change behaviors. And if done well, your uh, people are going to know that you're doing it and they'll be aware that something is happening. But if done harshly, and it can definitely be done harshly, you're going to receive resistance. And if you really want to do this work in a smooth way, you want to try to alleviate or bypass as much resistance as possible. Now, as I said, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, you know, this stuff applies because... It's hip hop forestry and poetry. It's getting late. It's floetry. It's academic superstar. Gonna plant a seed and grow a tree. In my front yard locally, or on my block, hopefully, make others do it globally. Not fresh air is more for me. I'm thankful for oxygen, a tree hugger, not again. But trees, my family, you see, I lost a lot of friends. Humans agree to mistake any for hungry. Like a racist really hates me before diversity, they want me. This uh, beginning of a verse is in a song that I have that is out now entitled Hip Hop Forestry. And what I really did it was try to bring two disciplines or fields together, an art form and a science form or a biological science, and to talk about them in ways that are interesting to me. I think that what's happening now, I've been, I, I'm being asked in a lot of uh, different arenas and venues to talk about, oh, hip hop and forestry. And do you think that's the best way of connecting youth and in particular youth of color, black uh, African-American, Latinx, or Hispanic, or First Nations, Native American, or Indigenous, uh, but also any other color. And if we want to make this about outside of that, we can talk about class. And of course, we, you know, we have many other populations, you know, sexuality, the ability. But I wanted to write this song uh, to bring these two fields together because I feel like they represent, they both represent something. Forestry represents a population that has to do with land ownership and you know, uh, in my opinion, um, inequity, you know, a lot of economics and hip hop deals with the community or communities now, but it comes from struggle. You know, hip hop was an art form that was formed. Uh, it came out of the Bronx with, between both black and brown communities and it was formed from poor people. So they created something that now is a billion dollar industry, the number one music form on the planet. So I wanted to, to go this hip hop forestry and poetry is getting late. Let's flow a tree. This academic superstar going to plant the seed and grow a tree. I use hip hop to teach people, right? So I try to teach you in order or steps. This academic superstar gonna plant a seed and grow a tree. 
Now I tell you where and when to do it, and I try to be inclusive as much as I can. In my front yard locally, or on my block, hopefully, because everyone didn't grow up with a front yard, everyone doesn't blow up in what I call the concrete jungle. Make others do it globally, which means that we want this to be done worldwide. Now fresh air is more for me. So now you're teaching, oh, more trees, more plants, then there's more oxygen. Next line, I'm thankful for oxygen, a tree hugger, not again. Now this is why I'm merging being a forester, but I'm also doing something else. So as a forester, I know what it's like to be frustrated when you're trying to get your job done and people are resisting you or protesting you. I've seen that and had that happen before. But the next line, with trees and my family, you see I lost a lot of friends. So when I think about my indigenous background, my indigenous culture, okay, my relationship with trees are different than what I learned in the classroom and learned in forestry. Trees are my family. They give me life. They are a part of me. So most humans... In the, on the planet were probably like me when I was a heavyweight or a heavier person because I used to weigh over 300 pounds at one time in my life. And when I think about you know how I used to eat, how I used to try to get sustenance, I was greedy. That's, that's why I say humans are greedy, mistaking it for hungry, right? And when you do that, you are destroying the planet. You're doing too much. There's too much development going on now. You know, like there's, there's it's a lot of noise now. So I'm just saying is that we're mistaken being hungry and we're being greedy like a racist really hates me before the diversity they want me. So it's like, I mean, I've worked in environments where people didn't really like me, but they had me there because of the financial benefit that they got. They didn't really want to understand me, but they were fine with me being there because there was another advantage that they had with me being there. Okay, so while somebody is benefiting, someone else may be suffering. While someone else is getting something good, someone else may, may not be. So I just wanted to, you know, introduce this, uh, you know, like this verse, get us continuing thinking about relationships, diversity, because the other thing is when you're doing diversity or administering diversity work, you're also dealing with history. OK, um, we all have our own personal histories. Even your organization has its own personal history. And when you're going through diversity or DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion, just to keep it short, you're breaking new ground and going back to the relational you're changing patterns, but this time you're changing patterns. You're, trying, you're, you're potentially changing narrative patterns, right? Like uh, we, like there are a number of people who probably have. I was on a call this morning with an individual at a school that I'm going to be working with next month, and this in the New England area, and she was uh, teaching me about some of the history from 1875 where she is in Connecticut or now. And she shared it with me. She was like, uh, you know, she said our children still get the incorrect narrative around, you know, around how this country was taken. She was like, you read that and it says European settlers showed up and indigenous people gave them the land. Like that's how these books read. But no, if you know the history of what my grandfather taught me, indigenous people uh, were killed. Uh, they were lied to. The land was stolen from them. And then even in his day, he was sent to boarding schools. And in those boarding schools, people were sterilized. So when teaching diversity, equity, history, and that's whether we're talking forestry or any other field, you're probably also changing a narrative because you're revealing a new truth. And you have to understand that when you are doing that, probably going to get resistance. Now, the ultimate reason why I love hip hop, OK, is because for me, hip hop saved my life. Hip hop is about expression. You have full autonomy. You also uh, display confidence. Hopefully it's genuine and real confidence. But you're also an individual. Right. So it means that you're unique. So you embrace your uniqueness. You don't try to be like somebody else. You're only going to be yourself. So when doing uh, and when performing hip hop, you have to learn your audience. You have to be able to respond to others. And then in hip hop, you uh, have to be able to go off the top of the mind, off the top of the dome, as we say, meaning you can freestyle without something written. Like I can freestyle for five minutes. I'm not going to do that to you all now, but freestyle five minutes without repeating myself and without writing it down or reciting a rhyme that I've had written. So that's the, for me, that's the, the, the fortune and maybe even the blessing of using hip hop. But hip hop isn't the only, only art form where people can display or teach through their passion. Hip hop is the art form that I choose to use, okay? And in case people here again, there may be some naysayers on the call or some who maybe, you know, hmm, what does this have to do with my learning anything? If you've ever taken a public speaking class or a speech class, everything that's on this slide is what you learn in the public speaking class or a speech class. So the other thing that I love about hip hop is you don't have to go to school to learn this. You don't have to have a book to learn this. You just have to appreciate an art form, art form and then explore it and then get deeper. But as I did say to you, I am a forester. And why did I go into forestry? 
because I took a different pathway and not a pipeline. Became a disciple of a discipline that's unheard by Blacks, Latinos, indigenous populations whose ancestry starts back before land domination, before emancipation, before cutting down trees, before PTSD with blue and red lights behind me. For life was so hard, I wanted to do some things. From concrete to floodplains, you can see our blood stains. We treated the soil that gave and still gives life. My vitamin D was not deficient because I was outside. So this is another verse in the song, Hip Hop Forestry. And to explain how I got into forestry, I said I took a different pathway, not a pipeline. Okay, because my mother is an educator, my father was an engineer, and here I am going into a different field that they do nothing about. So I said I became a disciple of a discipline that's unheard by. Unheard by who? Blacks, Latinos, indigenous populations. The three populations in particular that we're still trying to get to integrate or to be a part of this discipline. Okay, and so but while we're trying to get those populations, here's what's very ironic that those are the populations that we're trying to get. Their ancestry starts back before land domination, which means that you were part, we're part of communities that already knew what to do outdoors. We're part of communities that knew what plants were. We knew how to deal with trees. We knew how to plant food so that they can grow faster. So what is the, why are we disconnected from this and why is this discipline more homogenous than it is heterogeneous? But then I continue, I say before emancipation, before cutting down trees, that's to let people know that before the slave trade, even before, um, you know, before the Emancipation Proclamation, before land domination and cutting down trees, this land looked another way. And it was managed or supported, I would say, by different people. But that's also what I continue before PTSD with blue and red lights behind me. Now I'm talking about what goes on in the 21st century and what's going on in the 20th century, too. You know, police brutality. The thing I love about hip hop when bringing hip hop into even venues like this is that you can talk about multiple things at one time. And if you have the skill of knowing how to listen to hip hop and also have the skill of how to teach things chronologically or just in any kind of order, you can bring people back to it. So that's why I say for life was so hard. I wanted to do some things. I'm talking about anger. From concrete to floodplains, you can see our blood stains. From concrete to floodplains. Concrete, many people can't afford to live outside of the concrete jungle, to floodplains. Many populations of people were forced to live in an area that was not good, just like indigenous people being pushed off on reservations. I say you can see our blood stains, meaning we, we still die in these places. But these Black, Latinos, indigenous populations, we treated the soil they gave and still gives life, meaning that there's still life on this planet. There's still a lot to be saved and a lot to be salvaged. OK, a vitamin D was not deficient because I was outside. See, now we have young people who don't even go outside anymore. They sit inside. All of our vitamins that we take in are, are now in pills instead of being naturally in food and air and also in the water and in the sunlight. So these this 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 issue of exclusion that has touched our planet and is still here has impacted every population, whether you're black, white, brown, male, female, trans, poor, rich, middle class, employed or unemployed, temporary ability, you know, or a different ability or a disability. It's impacted everyone. Now, now I want to take you some through what I learned as a forester, but also what I learned in life, just to, you know, just to uh, bring this, you know, back to some of what we learned because of what, what we're here, what you all are here for this plant conference, because uh, when I worked in forestry, I worked in Montana, um, I've worked in Alabama, and of course, I went to a number of schools to learn this, this wonderful discipline. Well, in the forest sector, I learned to think for myself on the job. I had to learn to think for myself because I was working in a place where I was the only black person there, only black and brown person technically in the county. And so I had to learn the environment and the people had to try to figure out how to learn me. And the person who had the hardest job for real was me because I have to live in a place that I'm unfamiliar with. I have no family up here. I really have no connection to my community. So I have to figure out how to be here. Uh, when I worked at North Carolina State University, I became an entrepreneur while being an employee because I wasn't making a lot of money. So in life, what I learned is you can complain about circumstances or you can do something about them to improve them. And you have to figure out how to do it, uh, you know, to either not upset people or be willing to upset people because you know what and why you're doing it. And then I also learned diversity on the job. And what I mean by that is I didn't go to school for, for diversity, how to learn how I do what I do. I learned being the only person who looked like me in the county. I learned being the only one when I would go to different departments and start a new program. So a lot of what I teach people now is more so lived experience. So 
how do I identify? I say that my culture, you know, is black and indigenous. Uh, what I love about my culture is I don't we don't separate aspects of life because we understand that life is all connected. It's all a system. Right. If I eat something this morning that's bad for me and food poison, I'm still going to be sick the rest of the day, more than likely. So what I did this morning still matters now. So I think that for some people, especially those who come from different fields, like let's say engineering or another STEM field, science, technology, engineering, engineering, mathematics. Someone say, what does diversity have to do with any of this? And it's because diversity has to do with all of it, because everything is connected. And if you don't understand that, you might be a perpetrator hurting or leading or contributing to injustice in the place, right? Because you think things are bifurcated, but many things are all together. In my culture, I learned from my family history. I see how my ancestors survived and died. And in my culture, my ancestors live in me. So that means that I'm not alone, I'm here. Um, I'll get into why I'm sharing that here in, in a minute. And another thing that I don't do is I don't compare miseries. There's nothing new under the sun, so I'm not comparing black people to women, women to the same gender level people with different abilities to those without. No, because um, someone always has it worse, more, more than likely, and there are no really innocents in this. They're definitely victims, but there are no innocents because there's no group that has a monopoly on inequity and injustice. Now, to do all of this stuff around diversity, let me just take, take you through, you know, why diversity? Well, what does diversity mean? Many people, when I've asked this question, will say they will explain diversity, the definition to how it's expressed, like multiple thoughts, multiple groups of people, multiple ethnicities, multiple belief systems. Yeah, that's great. That sounds outstanding. But diversity really only means one word. It just means difference. But that's why I said people, when they answer this question, they will talk about how we express diversity or how we support diversity or how we should demonstrate it. Right. But if I just say, tell me what it is. Here's what the word means. So I think that in, in our fields in particular, but in any place or organization where people have differing or um, definitions of a term, it's going to be hard to actualize it there. Not impossible, but it's going to be hard. So I like to, when I'm teaching my clients in particular, I like to bring them almost to like the micro level of what diversity is and then take it higher. Um, other things that, um, as uh, as Patricia read, um, my uh, my doctorate is in adult education. I got it from NC State University. While there, I studied uh, a couple of actual streams of um, of scholarship. One was anti-racist scholarship, which we need that now more than ever. And then the other one is STEM faculty understanding their role in diversity during the day-to-day -day duties. Now, I want to focus on number two, the STEM faculty understanding their role, because I want to give you a framework that I used in academia that I think we could all use, whether we're talking plants, uh, the environment, environmental science, or forestry. And it's called Vitality. I actually got this framework from, beha uh, from uh, organizational behavior. So it's about business. But I took out, like in my study, I put, I had faculty vitality. I took faculty out and just said, suggested you can implement any word you want there, any kind of leader you want there, any kind of position. But the point of this this uh, framework is that when people are vital in these spaces, they engage in four things, decision-making processes, okay? You, you, you get to talk about uh, decisions and steps that impact you and other people. Intellectual exchange, the healthy sharing of ideas among colleagues, whether it's in leaving a restroom, passing each other in the hallway, walking down each other before COVID, uh, in a Zoom room, if you will, or when before COVID, it, it would be uh, maybe passing, walking by the water fountain. Right. But this intellectual exchange. Then you have social activities. If people are vital. You engage in social activities, the, the, the gatherings and engagements that contribute to collegial relationships. And then last but not least, mentoring relationships, the relationships to help junior members to establish themselves and move up in different parts of their professional lives. So my research said that if these four things, the people in your organization are not involved in all four of these things, then they're not vital. OK. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that we all, myself included, we've also gone through socialization processes, like how to behave in the space, how to dress in the space, how to talk in the space, how to be and how to think in the space. So I also uh, learned a lot about socialization because many people who do or don't get involved in diversity probably do or don't get involved because of someone that they looked up to that trained them, whether it's on the job like here or whether it's in, in, in my cases in academia. So socialization is the process by which a person learns the values, norms, and required behaviors, which permit them to participate as a member of the organization. So 
PCA, you have your own culture. People have to learn how to be there, right? And every other organization that is on this call, your organization has its own culture. And you have to figure out how to be there or learn how to be there. Now, the other thing that I'm proud to share is that, um, as, I, as I said, in my culture, we don't separate things. So I also learned a lot when I was a, uh, I was a pastor. I was a campus pastor. That's before I had a beard. So it was cool. I was some slimmer now, but I definitely had more fur on my face now. But back then, I definitely learned a lot in ministry because in ministry, even though it was uh, fun, at times taxing, but I learned so much and I did it for four years. I learned to connect with people and support them through difficult times and in difficult times. OK, uh, because there's a lot going on now, even with COVID challenges with mental health, emotional health, physical health. But in ministry, I also learned how to work through conflict. It is something to be among people who you think love and care about each other and they can't stand each other for some reason. Um, I learned the importance of communicating effectively and thoughtfully. When you're speaking to 100 plus people, you have to be as best as you can able to touch everybody. OK, without forcing it. So I learned a lot of that via ministry. And I also observed the resilience of people and the positive behavior when people when folks come together with different opinions. The wonderful thing about diversity, in my opinion, is I think that there's this misnomer that diversity is about getting everybody on the same page. I don't think so. I do think that diversity is about fairness and getting everybody in the same place, but for us to move together with the differing views, which leads to us having better solutions because we may not all agree, we may not all see it like this, but we can still keep the mission um, at hand and keep it moving. And so um, I'd like to invite you to consider this question, and I'm not here to proselytize because I'm not about to take you to church or anything, but I do want to ask you to consider something, faith versus faith practice. Is everyone a person of faith? And it is my opinion, the answer is yes, everyone is a person of faith. Not religious faith, but human faith, meaning you have faith in something. You have a hope in what you're doing. We care to manage or to better uh, sustainably manage our plants because we want a better planet. We hope that that behavior will lead to that. That's faith. OK, many of us went to school to get a job. Many of us majored in something to work in a certain place. So when you're doing diversity work, in my opinion, I believe that you have to find avenues and ways to speak people's language, speak to their values, speak to what they hope for, what they hope in. OK, and that's a and that's a good way of disarming people and bringing people into the fold. And even through all of this, I still have a question for you. Why is diversity so hard in any environment usually? So part of the reason why diversity is hard is because you can't solve a problem until you realize you're part of the problem that you're trying to solve. So I encourage people to think about why diversity programs fail or even a struggle. Uh, there's no accountability a lot of times. Like you have people who say, I care about this, I wanna do this, but they don't wanna learn about it, okay? Or yeah, teaching, we're gonna have this diversity session, but they don't come to the session. And many leaders, a lot of times of organizations, CEOs in particular, or those higher ups, do this a lot because of, I understand you are very busy, but it is true you make time for what you value and what you want to do. So I encourage anyone here who's a leader that says, I don't have time, I can't learn about this stuff, uh, make time. Find a way to make time. Because the common model, which is a, actually a very, uh, uh, it's, it's a fallacy, uh, which is to hire someone to make it their job to do the work that the institution or the organization as a collective needs to be doing. So now as I'm getting ready to take us down, as I'm going to the last part of my presentation, OK, I'm going to have a conversation around a topic that I think I don't think that is hopefully people won't feel nervous or weird about it. But I am going to talk about uh, some things more so racially, if you will, but also professionally. Uh, so I want to talk about navigating environmental spaces as a professional who teaches. because I am a professor as well as an administrator there at Yale University. But I've also worked in, the, in, the, in other industries. People, in particular folks of color, but and at times women too, or trans individuals, uh, same gender level, were asking me questions. And this is a question that I still get a lot to this day. How do you show up in a white space? And I go, oh, tell me what a white space is like, define that for me. And then after I ask people that, I start asking them this question. When did you start minimizing yourself after you show up in the space? You see, and the reason that I ask people that question is because that question to me, you're basically telling me that you just silenced yourself. 
Because you're asking me, how do I show up? How do I show up? What do you mean? I'm alive. I'm present. Uh, I am here. You know. And so I share with them that it's not just about white spaces, but you're probably battling going back to socialization. I'll give you an example. I had a young man uh, who identifies, uh, he was uh, um, Latinx, just, just met him last year. Uh, and um, he got turned on to be from someone else who's a former student of mine. He works with them. They said, yeah, I think you should talk to Dr. Easley. And on the call, first thing that this young man asked me was, um, he says, how do you show up in a white space? I was like, wow, I've been getting this question a lot for like the last five years. And I said, define a white space for me. He said, well, it's a place where it's majority or all white people. So then I said, okay, well, do you identify as white? And he says, no. I said, okay. So then what happens when you show up there? And then he went, hmm. <laughs> you know, then it's like, well, I feel uncomfortable. I don't feel right. I don't feel valued. I don't feel that I can show myself here. Then I, and then that's when I go to the next question. So when did you start minimizing yourself? When did you start doing that? And what people will do, and I'm going to watch, I, I, I'm going to, I don't, I'm not going to tread lightly because I'm speaking about my experience, but I understand that some people may be hearing this and it may sound like I'm about to go down a victim blaming avenue, but I'm not going there. Stay with me. But what I am going to do is say this. Some of what people are experiencing in these spaces, they are bringing on to themselves. I do I do wholeheartedly believe that. I didn't say all of it, but I do believe some of it. Because as I kept talking to that young man and I asked him, when did you learn to start doing this? He, he, he said he started learning how to silence himself in college. So we kept talking. And lo and behold, he really learned it at home from his mother and father. And we had to talk about that, right? Because now he's he was starting to be angry like mom and dad. And I'm like, no, 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 no. See, this is why you have to know personal history. You have to understand defense and coping mechanisms. Why do we do the things that we do? Why do we learn the way that we learn? It was to protect you. But somewhere along the line, that silencing you has turned into a poor behavior. And now it hurts you because you can't use your voice. See, it was done in a way to protect you and keep you out of trouble. And now you're using your voice means that you're kind of pushing against the norm. Now I'm about to put another slide up here. We're going to now have a conversation about it because I'm, I'm presenting to you. I want to put this term up here and it's, and it's called whiteness. Okay. This is not about a man or a woman or everybody or anyone on this call. This is about a culture that is going on in our country. I'm not making up any of these terms. All I do is borrow them, use them, or try to correct them and contact the scholar who came up with them. <laughs> uh, but this, the whiteness is something that I think everyone has to navigate. I have had to navigate that. It is defined as uh, white racialized identity refers to the way that white people, their customs, culture, and beliefs operate as the standard by which all other groups of are compared. Um, in the workplace about two years ago, um, I had a student, African-American student, woman, Southerner, like myself, and she was really agitated at something going on at the school. She wasn't agitated with me. She was agitated with something going on at the school. And so she asked to, uh, to, to meet with me and we were, had a meeting. I was walking in the hallway. She saw me in the hallway and just started talking to me, you know, and I, fine. And so she's sharing her passion and sharing all of that with me and my supervisor who's who is the dean 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 indy burke amazing leader by the way please look her up you know she walks by okay and uh she sees us talking i, I, I saw i feel her energy because she looked at me and almost like i'm in trouble like oh god the student is giving thomas all of the business right now and she walked back by still and we're still there talking because she, she was going to the restroom coming back so we out there for about five minutes and then I had another meeting coming up that I still had 10 minutes before the meeting, right? So what my supervisor did, you know, bless her, is try to kind of uh, deviate from the energy and go, oh, Thomas, you know, this person's here waiting on you. And I said, oh, yeah, no, I know, I know he's there and he's going to continue to wait because we have 10 more minutes. So I'm going to finish talking to the student. See, so I knew what I was doing. So I'm going to finish talking to her. Let's say later in that day when we had our conversation, you know, and I appreciate it. She was concerned for me. She was like, oh, man. And the concern was that the student was going off on me or bringing me down or tearing me down because she was speaking so passionately. And I was like, no, we were just having a conversation. I never felt threatened at all. I was enjoying the conversation. As a matter of fact, I prefer for people to talk to me direct like this because at least I know where you're coming from. See, but the question that I would have is who said it's wrong? to passionately speak in a workplace? Who determines how we're supposed to look and dress in a workplace? 
And this is why I wanted to bring you back to this term. This is why I wanted to put it up there, the normalized beauty. Like, you know, who who decided this? Who, who, who decided that I should wear a shirt and tie when I go to work to be formal or to be appropriate? You know, uh, when, you know, ties actually choke me at times, you see? So even though that's simple, that's that 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 micro level that I took it to, you can expand that to to the macro level. Hence why I really tell people that you have to think about things in systems because everything is connected. Consider every system that you engage with and ask yourself, do you see yourself in that system? Do you see your culture in that system? Do you see your values reflected in that system? Whether it's banking, whether it's housing, whether it's education. In my case, I'll say education. Whether it's judicial, justice, whether it's government, whether it's the medical system, whether it's religious, and in our case, whether it's the environment. Do you see yourself there? But here's the thing, the reason why I say systems thinking, because if you say that the environment is not diverse, like man, the environmental field is not diverse, we need to diversify this, we need to have more people here, then you have to ask yourself, well, where are people learning about the environment and who's teaching them, okay? Then you have to ask yourself, why is it people are not interested in this? And I would even encourage other people who may be on this call, why are you so interested in it? And why are you so interested in diversifying it, okay? If you're not willing to change the structure, change the place. Because everything is connected. If I walk into a place and I'm not really feeling secure and I walk into a place that there's no pieces of me reflected on the wall, I may actually feel like I don't belong there, right? But it's still on me how I behave while I'm there. But I just want you to think about that. Like you as leaders in your spaces, you can help set up environments for people to empower themselves by being a little bit more mindful and being thoughtful. So yes, I ask you the question again, why do we need to diversify? I tell people that the diagnosis determines the treatment, the why determines the how. So if people say that we just need to diversify our fields because we need to hear from more people and have more brilliance here to come up with more solutions, I think, yeah, that's 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 okay, you know, but that's me being sarcastic because I don't think that that's the only reason why we need diversity. I think we need more diversity because communities of people have been marginalized and pushed aside. And a lot of what they know and understand how to live Others have either stolen it or others are trying to use it or they want to understand it. So that's why I go back to using my indigenous uh, heritage, my indigenous knowledge when it comes to doing things in the outdoors, because I know a lot of what my ancestors did was stolen from them. And I look at my grandfather, who's not a college or a high school graduate, the way that he he tilled the land and managed the land and fed us off of the land. And he and my grandmother still are the two smartest people that I ever knew. But working with them, they showed they also taught me something. The reason why you don't separate, okay, is because you want to be able to use your mind and your heart. Some may say heart, hand, and 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 head in the work that you're using. I notice that when I talk about diversity in certain environments, there's a there, there is an IQ drop. People just like they don't get it. I don't know what to do. And so what I encourage people to do is learn other people's history. I just say put yourself in other people's shoes because you can't. Okay, but learn other people's history and learn how people are. Uh, being impacted by various things that are going on. And what you'll see is the people who have not delved deep into, into a lot of this work, they walk in a victimized lens, okay? They're externally stimulated. They probably get fulfilled only from the job. They're overly concerned with what other people think about them. They question themselves all the time. They're never at ease, always on edge because you, because, because you can't calm down. It's like you can't trust anyone. You feel like you're always a, there's always a target on your back. You think that people, you think people want to change and want everything to be equal. So what happens? So the reason why I put that there is because some people struggle when they see, oh yeah, they say they care about diversity, but I still don't see the behavior or the policies that reflect that, right? Which then contributes to people feeling like a victim again. And then also say it's hard to get past the no. There's some people who feel entitled that, that they should be able to pursue whatever they want to pursue. And they should be able to do whatever they want to do. And we even tell, tell people that you can do whatever you want to do. But I'm like Chris Rock. You can do it, whatever you want to do that you're good at and as long as they're hiring. So I help people to be and feel empowered, okay, because I don't think I can give you power, but I can help you uh, by setting up an environment for you to empower yourself. So I encourage people to control what you can control. So you be internally driven. Look inside to get inspiration. Make sure that the job is part of your life, not your life. Because you need to get time time away. You, you need to take 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 time away from from that from that job. Uh, do your job, but leave time and space for other fulfilling things, 
right? My, my work is not the only place I have friends. Outside of work, I have way more friends than I do at work. And it's not because I'm not a friendly person. It's because when I leave work, I like to leave work at work. And when I interact with friends from work, I notice that we still talk about work and I don't want to do that. Question the culture of the place that you work, which I still do even, even now. You know, like, have we always done this and why do we do this? Stay calm when it gets chaotic. And when everybody's like, we, like when George Floyd and everything happened last year, everyone was losing it and we need to hurry up and come up with a statement. We need to hurry up and put something out. And I'm like, yeah, you might want to collect and gather some information first before you react in that way. Consider that people may not want change. See, that's how I keep from being disappointed. I know that there are a lot of people who don't want DEI to work, you know, and that doesn't bother me, actually. I'm just glad to when I know who, who, who those individuals are. And I'm not afraid of hearing a no because a no is just one response. I can probably get a yes from someone else or I can go somewhere else. So in case you're wondering, my concept of self, I do see myself as intelligent, but do you see yourself as intelligent? Do I think that um, I should give my all at work? Why would I give my all at work to a place that doesn't give us all to me? Do I feel out of place when I'm at work? I don't feel out of place now because I'm working. Um, but there's these other, these other questions that I like to ask myself. Am I okay not knowing the answer? I don't fake like I know everything. And even with a doctorate, you can definitely see a lot of scholars or people with doctors to do that. All scholars don't have doctors. Are you clear that your place of work does not give us all to you? I already asked that question. And if you're black or, or identify with another population that's been marginalized, do you actually recognize that your progress and presence and ways of processing can be protested in a place of work? I have noticed that being in my place of work, that sometimes my confidence, I notice other people feel, un, they feel uneasy about it as if I'm not supposed to be confident. My progress, sometimes people may feel like if you do something, it's, it's like this, it's like um, there's this misnomer that people have that if I do one thing for one person, I have to do it for all people. I actually don't agree with that because equity is not uniform. What you do for one person, meaning that you meet their needs, that's, that is equitable. Whereas other people, they may not need that. See? So I encourage people to be a little bit more thoughtful about that instead of just trying to, like I said, get everybody on the same page, which means that it takes more work. Your uniqueness is usually attractive when you're trying to be hired. But once you get the job, compliance is desired. I've noticed that, you know, with, with the way that with, with my work at times. But I work to understand people. I don't fight to be understood. So my energy is more so focused on you and it's focused on me to manage myself on you to understand so I can be more present in the place, not trying to get you to bend to me. Um, and I'd still say it, you make time for what you want to do as I navigate environmental spaces. And for those people sometimes who feel triggered and touched in these spaces, you're not crazy, but you have to work to get back parts of you that you sacrificed. You may be like, what do you mean sacrificed? Because if you're like me, you've been on this journey for a long time. You've been sacrificing since you went to school. In school, they told you you had to behave a certain way. Then the job tells you to be a certain way. Then the discipline tells you to be a certain way. And you get another job. Now you have to change again. So I've lived this, this existence where I've learned how to adapt, adopt, adapt, adopt. But now I'm at a place where I'm like, no, I'm not adapting or adopting or capitulating anymore. I'm going to contribute to the place changing and it's going to change around me. But I can do that without making too many people feel uneasy because I, like I said, work to understand. So these and so all of these experiences that I have here uh, are experiences that have informed me. So instead of going through the rounds, I'm going to just go ahead and go through the tips that I want to leave you with uh, for those who want to do diversity or who, who want diversity. Remember, everyone has to be involved. OK, you have to have a macro vision, but, you, but micromanaging is going to hurt diversity because you have to trust the people that you work with. The same way you want someone to trust you when they come in the workplace, you have to trust them if you decide to bring a professional in like myself. As you think about diversity, don't just make this about what the place looks like. You need to focus on how the place operates. So don't negate the policies and rules that govern how you operate, because those are the things a lot of times the people don't want to touch. Mind your blind spots. And not to sound ableist, blind spots are also awareness gaps. OK, what you don't notice and willingly ignore can hurt someone and it can also hurt you, too. Uh, when people do diversity workshops, and I'm so honored to be here with you all today, it should be tied at all levels. That's why I'm glad to be in this program where there's so many people. You know, so that means I guess I'm talking to maybe most members or different folks within this community. And so uh, I want to, you know, thank you all for planning it this way. You know, but that's how diversity workshops should be. 
Remember, people are more than their jobs. Uh, I get asked a lot now to do things around hip hop because they understand that people like hip hop. People like people like to be entertained, but they like to be educated while being entertained. So that's the reason why I started off with saying I know that my talk could be engaging and in, and entertaining, uh, but it's also informing and it's also educational. So I don't let people minimize my work anymore like that. Um, if the morale is low in your place, and this is for me, this is this is what I learned working with people. Don't go and try to start a new initiative to work on the relationship. Remember diversity, relationally, historically. And then for those people, those individuals who want who want change, um, I encourage you to learn the organization, know what everyone is doing, and know the history of the place. That's how I've been able to support myself at times and not burn out is by going in there and learning how the place got put together. Like so, if the place got put together with no equity in mind, then I'm not going to just grab the bullhorn and start yelling equity, equity, equity. Okay, I'm going to figure out. I got to find avenues to integrate equity and then bring people along with me. Uh, I'm going to develop an agenda, but I want to try to align it with the bottom line of the organization. Because if I can reduce resistance as much as possible, I can get a lot more done instead of contributing in some ways to the resistance by pushing a poke in the bear instead of trying to bring people along with me. And this is also about reciprocity because I do the things that I want done, but I also try to behave with people the way that they want to be treated. Create relationships in your organization and build allies or build advocates. It's self-explanatory. Put a time limit on whatever you're working on, uh, because sometimes you could be overbearing. Sometimes it may be time to let it go and move on to the next thing. Remember, you can't control everything, but you can better manage yourself so that you don't burn out or give up or or more or, or worse quit. And learn the priorities of the organizations and learn what the leaders value. That's the other thing that I figured out. If I know what the leaders actually value, I can get a heck of a lot more done. And then if I can communicate my priorities, that's why I say be clear about your priorities in this first bullet, you can bring people along with you. Don't try to control everything because you can't. That's one of the reasons why people lose themselves. Learn to speak other's languages, give voice to their values, as I said in that on that fake slide, and utilize emotional intelligence, which means reciprocate. Let that be the center of what you do. If you don't like it, don't do it, but don't judge people by your standards. And here to give you the final piece of the philosophy of hip-hop forestry, and then we'll open it up for questions. It's hip-hop forestry. Forestry is to practice hip-hop's the religion, both made by human, both imperfect, make a new tradition. It's hip-hop forestry. Our trees are not a commodity. They are teachers showing us how to live on troubled land and live in harmony. It's hip-hop forestry because both rose from the underground. One changed the landscapes, the other changed the landscapes of sound. It's hip-hop forestry. You're not scared when people or bugs approach you. We don't just worry about POs, it's parole officers, but we worry about CO2, carbon dioxide. Hip hop forestry, emissions, we don't do carbon copies. We cross pollinate culture and respect our water and bodies. This forestry hip hop. We are related. We respect forms of life. You can't treat me worse than a pet. Something about that ain't right. This forestry hip hop. In different forms, we dialogue and debate. In forestry hip hop, you can't own what you didn't create. In forestry hip hop, respect life because life is a value. We listen, then discuss, problem solve, then we add you. This forestry hip hop, inclusion is retribution, not just seeking solutions. And food, water, religion, we remove pollution. This for hip hop, every complexion is worth of protection. Care for the land and the people, that's true progression. This for hip hop, started in New York and now it hits the planet. Carolina with forestry, land is not just to be managed, it's to be respected because we all been elected. Two communities come together in one body, now let's protect it. That one body is me, but that one body could be you. Communities come together in all of us. Uh, Carolina, North Carolina's where forestry was first practiced in this country. Came Gifford Pinchot, Germany, came here, then went to Yale to start the, uh, forest, the, the, the School of Forestry, which is now the School of the Environment. Hip hop started in New York, now it's all across the planet. But I want to go back to that line, and this is my last thing that I'll say. In different forms, with dialogue and debate in forestry hip hop, you can't own what you didn't create. Uh, predatory capitalism really is uh, still leading a lot of what we do in the world. Greed still uh, is leading a lot of what we do in the world. And so when we talk about plants, whether it's horticulture or trees, you know, these plants, these trees belong to the planet. And we are part of the planet, so they belong to us, but not for domination, but for respect and for, and for use. And I haven't met anyone who knows how to create land. 
just and that's why I said in the forestry hip hop you can't own what you didn't create. Uh, we have a lot of people who own land and practicing many ways on the land, and then we say we want to ex- open this land and bring more people in, but protect wilderness areas. There's no such thing as wilderness area because it's usually defined like there was no one there, and that's not true. There were people there. So I just encourage us to think a little bit deeper about our practices. Think about the history of what we've learned. Think about the history of how we got to where we are. And recognize that we all have privilege. We all have things we can teach. We all have things that we can learn. And on that note, I will end from Bulldog to Bulldog, HBCU to Ivy League. Dr. Thomas Rashard Easley is here with you. And uh, there goes my contact. If you'd like to chat with me or reach out to me, Yale for recruitment or other academic business. And uh, as a consultant, you can reach uh, me on the, on the right side. And I'll stop sharing my screen and open this up and hopefully you have questions or uh, you know maybe some suggestions or ideas. Here I am. I wanted to just say that yes it was educational and informative but also enjoyable so thank you so much for that. I think you said a lot of things um, that really spoke to me and It must have been difficult that all of us had our microphones off, even though that was necessary because I was talking to the screen enough that it kept telling me, you're muted, you need to unmute. Um, But in particular, when you talked about passionate speaking, that's something I run into um, in all of my life, you know, like at home, at work. Um, And so I try to be really, because I am one of the types who can, who just speaks up. And um, I've, you know, learned some tricks to try to be more mindful for those people who need a little bit more time um, to formulate their thoughts or to um, sort of enter the conversation. And I was just curious if you have found any sort of tricks of the trade to really um, encourage people to use their voice, um, knowing that sometimes they're just not comfortable doing that. But maybe there's ways to do that that I haven't heard of. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, question about helping people to use their voice. Um, okay. Uh, well, one, I, if, if you can, so some of what I'm about to say is an if, because I don't assume that everyone can do this. So one, if you can get with someone else to share what's on your mind so that they can affirm you, that would be great. Well, not so that they can affirm you. It'd be great if they do affirm you, but so that someone else is hearing what you're saying before you say it out to to a bunch of people. So that's I think that that's helpful. So at least you're not speaking without knowing the impact that you could potentially have. Number two, to be able to articulate why you want to use your voice, like what is actually going on, okay? Because because at some point, let's say if you're very irate in the moment, at some point you're going to calm down, and when you calm down, it'd be great to be able to share with people you know, what, what's happening. And it is easier to talk than it is to yell. And it's easier for people to hear you speaking than it is to hear you yelling. All right, now there are also times when you may have to show out, and you may have to show up. And I just encourage people to then think about the consequences before they do any, in, in, any action. Just let's just think about it, you know, uh, because I don't, because many times we don't have to be hit from from behind, you know, with some of the things that, that are happening. We just have to process it and just think about what, what are going to be the consequences, what could be the potential consequences. Now, when you go through all three of what I said, if you really think about what I just said, you've thought about the potential of what can happen. You've talked about the reality of what you are thinking and what you want to happen. And then you've also talked about how you feel in the moment. So if you now use your voice, you tend to, in my opinion, are the most informed person doing what you're doing. Because you processed all of that if you're going through that. So now when you talk and if someone says, I don't understand what you're saying, you can say, okay, well, then tell me what you don't understand. If someone says, I don't like how that sounded, and so, okay, well, then tell me what, what you didn't like about it. If someone says you're doing something that you don't feel like you're doing, you can then say, well, I don't agree with that. I don't think I'm doing that, but maybe we can talk about it. And, um, you know, but remember, I said if. I wanted to put some ifs there because everyone doesn't always have that. You know, they don't have access to that, which then leads me to the last thing that I want to say. Talk to yourself in the mirror, journal and write down why you want to do what you want to do. I encourage people to look at the history of what an organization in particular, if that's where you want to raise your voice, what happened to other people who raised their voice. You have to ask yourself if you want the same thing to happen to you. And, you know, and if you're like me, like I've never really felt safe in a place of work. So I don't really get stuck when it's time to use my voice because I'm like, 
they probably don't want to hold on to me anyway, you know, because I probably make them nervous. So, you know what? I'm hurting myself. I'm not saying anything. My piece means more than than, than them liking me. So I'm thinking I'm going to use my voice. And I prioritize my piece over everything. I can still sleep at night. So that's just a quick answer. But I can tell you more offline or go with no, that's fantastic. Thanks. Okay. I can't tell if anyone, if we have, I don't think we have questions in the chat, Maggie. Okay. And if others want to go ahead and um, turn on your video. I or... have a quick question. Oh, I do see. Hello. Hi, Dr. Easley. My name is Ann Francis. I am wondering if you have any tips for um, when you're in a situation and you notice that a colleague is being treated in a way that you perceive to be unfair or um, not welcoming or not accepting their difference, how you as a colleague can support or change the environment to to make that person to just change the dynamic right to to make it better okay change the dynamic and make it better but make it better for the purpose of what is that we making it better so this person can feel more included or probably that better? yeah give that person a chance to uh use their voice to say what they want to say without without either you're noticing that they're self silencing or you're noticing that somebody else in the room is uh, making them feel unwanted, uncomfortable, not welcome. That sort of thing. Or is okay. it anybody's place to be that mediator? Well, well, I, I, I'll, I'll say this. If you have a relationship with that person, and you do know something about what's going on. I'm not, I don't want to say it's your quote unquote job to be that, but this is where the whole mind heart part, you know, like comes in. Uh, but if it's about being supportive of the person and you have a relationship with them, okay, and things are happening in the moment, if you could, it'd be great to check in with them before you do something, you know, before you say something like, hey, I, I, I sent something. Can I, you know, would you mind if I actually address this? So the other thing that I also encourage people to do at times um, is if you're going to, I'm sorry, I just did that because someone asked what was on my shirt, so I just pulled the shirt down. I'm not trying to promote that, even though this is a shirt of one of my artists, but that's not what I'm doing it for. I'm just covering my body. Um, I always encourage people to either A, think about yourself if you were in that situation. One, what would you want people to do for you? But that does not mean you do what you want people to do for you. Just think about yourself in that situation. And one thing that you'll probably see is that the person is nervous. And they're not at ease. OK, all right. We all know what that's like. OK, uh, not at ease. I also say look at the other dynamic that you share in was that someone else is doing something. OK, so, you know, and something else could be happening. So then let's take inventory of what's actually happening. Now, the next thing that I will tell you to do is based on your position at the organization. OK, or maybe even your role in the meeting. OK, because if your position is you're the head of something like if you're the president, the CEO or anything like that and you notice it. Then shame on you if you don't do something about it. That I will say, OK, because you are if you and as a leader, you have a chance to do something and to address it. This is a learning opportunity. And if you don't do it, that actually sends a message to the rest of the organization that this is OK. Technically, it does like, you know, saying no is actually saying yes to something. If you are leading this meeting and something is starting to get out of hand and you don't say anything, I still say the same thing because I'm like, what's the purpose of why we're here? And I think that's the other thing I always remember. Why are we actually here? And if we can get us back on moving, you know, then let's do that. But here's another thing that you can also do. You can wait for the experience or the meeting to be over. And you can check in with him or her a day after. You can ask them what it is that they would like for you to do. You can even say, I wanted to do something. I'd like to ask you, how do you feel about if, if I was to do this? You see, because it's much better if it's about me with me than about me without me, you know? And then if that person says, I'm good, I don't need to do anything, then you, then you have to honor that, you know, or you should honor that, I, I would say that. But if it's good, 
But if you don't do something, something is still going to continue. Then I just encourage you to continue to dig a little deeper and find out if you can do something else to make it happen. Uh, you know, like to make something happen. But I hope that's answering your question because I don't know all the dynamics of their specific example. But I know like when that's been me and I've been in the space and people, I've had that happen where people have wanted to back me up. People are real quick. You don't got to back Thomas up. You don't got to do that. Because if I'm not saying something, it's because I don't want to. I'm like, I'm good. I see them at the five. We're good. I'm like, I'll see them at the five. Like, I'll see them when the, when, when the day of work is over. Or I'll go to the office on my own. You see, you know, I don't necessarily do things in front of people because I'm not insecure why I need to, you know, like make myself feel bigger in front of other people. I'd rather do it um, offline and do it um, when, when no one else is there so you know how I genuinely feel. So, yeah. Thank you very much. There's feedback for me too, so I'm going to okay. limit my, my feedback. That was very helpful. Okay, thank you. I saw Brian had his hand up, and if you still have another minute or two, uh, Dr. Easley, I, you know, we could maybe entertain the another question. Mm -hmm. Okay. I thought you had me until like three fifty or four. Um, for the Q and A, we have about 15, 20 minutes, okay. which we we burned through, which is okay. We didn't actually okay. do a lot of Q and A yet or anything, but um, you know, so so we have one final thing on the agenda before we close our meeting. Okay. Um, but I did see Brian's hand up. I don't. Oh, and Brian, are you ready to go? Introduce yeah. yourself, please. Yeah, yeah. Hello, uh, Dr. Easley. Hey, I have a, a comment. I uh, hope it's appropriate. I want to compare you to somebody. I uh, I looked you up on on the dean's site, and the first image that came up is a really cool image of you. And I thought, since you're a lyricist, it looked like Curtis Jackson. Yeah, very famous. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. That's a compliment. That's a compliment. I hope so. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a rapper, but you're a hip hopper, but he's he's an entrepreneur and yeah, neat yeah. picture. Anyway, yeah. no, I <laughs> I just had another comment. I I missed your your heritage. I think you you alluded to it a few times, but you you are Native American as well as African American. I identify that, as both. Yes, from my maternal and paternal side. So my maternal side, Seminole Nation, paternal side, Choctaw and Poar Creek. Uh, and um, I was raised with my grandfather. So I know a little bit, you know, about, uh, you know, about his upbringing and his family migrating from Florida up to Montgomery, Alabama, and then coming to Birmingham. I do not know as much as I would like to yet about my family from Easley, South Carolina, that migrated from there to, to a Tennessee and then continued on to Louisiana, and now uh, they settled in Texas. So I have a lot of family, uh, uh, you know, from, from from my nation side. But then, of course, black because we mixed because my grandmother on both sides was black, and uh, great grandmothers, excuse me. Um, and so, you know, uh, there, there is still some missing information for me, you know. But uh, I, I share that more in the presentation. I don't do like I think most. I think indigenous uh, folks do because I'm still learning. I think most people would leave and not just introduce themselves, they were speaking their native language and then they would share their share their nations. As I'm still uncovering, I like to, you know, honor my, my ancestors, but in a way stay in my lane because I'm still learning. So I don't just come out with that at first. You know, I like bring I bring people in because I basically grew up, I let me I say I grew up African American. Um, I come from a civil rights family. My grandfather pushed. Uh, my uh, uncle who's passed away, his name is James Orange, but you can look him up. He's like a famous civil rights uh, leader. And when my grandfather lost his job, when they found out that my uncle was, you know, doing the work, my, grand said, my granddad said, he said, oh, I couldn't have told them a true story really about who I was and who I really was, but because he looked black, he said, all right, son, get back out there and keep fighting. Don't make me lose my job being in vain. You know, he was like, hey, he said, because this is hurting all of us. So it, it was. It does my heart good to know that my grandparents were the ones who pushed my mom and her siblings to get involved in the civil rights movement, as they were also involved in those Cool, cool history. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. And Elisa Samoy. Hi. Um, I'm sorry. I know that we are almost out of question time. Um, but I wanted to, well, first of all, um, I appreciate that last comment because working within for Indian country, um, you know, a lot of us are native, but some of us are pretty far removed from 
um, you know, the the culture and traditions that our parents and grandparents grew up in. Mm-hmm. And so, um, mm-hmm. yeah, but so my first, I want to offer my compliment on the victimization versus empowering um, slide that you have. And mm-hmm. my question is how in this like post COVID day and age, do you empower your colleagues and your coworkers um, and to have a voice in the virtual setting? Mm, okay, in a virtual setting. Well, I just wanna, uh, 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 can, can you tell me your name again too, Leader? I'm so sorry. No, that's okay, Alisa. Alisa, okay. You know uh, what I think the feedback is? I think it's because, well, this has happened to me when I was presenting before. Your volume is probably really loud, <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. I'm um, trying to, how about now? Is that, is that better? Um, yeah, yeah. Is, yep. is that better? Mm-hmm. Okay, great, okay. Well, I don't want to say, and this isn't a push back on you at all, okay? I just want to, you know, just to clarify something for me. I don't, I don't necessarily really think that I can empower people. You know, I, uh, but what I feel that I can do, and, and maybe I miss, I miss, you know, like representing it, uh, even I hope, I, I hope not, but I believe that I can create or, or set up or develop environments for people to empower themselves. So what I do now in the virtual uh, environment, because I have student workers who report to me, I have uh, now about five staff people who, who report to me, but two who officially report to me, you know, like the other three have a beeline to me and then the two who have, you know, who, who, who report to me uh, or, or report with me, I should say, because I, I, I really try to use a shared power model. I shouldn't say try because I do it. I use a shared power model in the way that I work. And so when if I'm facilitating meetings, I make sure that I get the input of everyone else. If people are going to be listening to me, come to the meeting just to listen to me, I still minimize how long I speak, okay, and then open it up to, to, to everyone else. If there's something that I'm teaching or talking about that I know someone else is skilled in, I try to support them and ask them to come and present with me so that they're not, uh, you know, so that it's not all coming from the dean, if you will, or from the assistant dean. Um, you know, sometimes people may feel like you're a superstar when people see you use your voice and they're scared to use their voice. You know, that's kind of a, that's a, that's the beginning of resentment. If people see you as freer than they see themselves, you know what I mean? So um, I really try to invite, not try to, I, I really invite people to be a part of whatever it is that I'm doing. And here's another thing, because I know that I'm not successful alone, I'm really big on sharing who and how people supported me in the process publicly so that people don't feel like they're not recognized or that they're not uh, acknowledged. But I also check with people too sometimes, like, hey, and I say sometimes, but I don't do it all the time. Like my assistant, I don't check with her every time. I like give her, not a compliment, but like give her, you know, props for the work that uh, that she does. You know, sometimes I do it, um, you know, and sometimes I check with her, especially if it's something that I'm like wondering if she may not want me to share something she may want to share herself. So I'm really very benevolent in a way in how and how I work. And I really try to delegate um, enjoying authority, okay? Not delegate responsibility. So I delegate enjoying authority. So I'm like, hey, you, you want people to see you doing the work? Okay, then let me help you create this so you can take credit for it, you know? So I just involve, so I'll, I'll say this to be quiet because I know I, I'm, I'm long-winded. If I show you how to do something, right, you'll, you'll forget it, you'll do some of it. I tell you how to do it, you probably are going to forget mostly all of it. But if I do it with you, we're both going to change. So that's how I try to uh, support my people. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We do have another question that just came into the chat. Okay. I don't know if, would you like to go ahead and read your question? Sure. Um, I I wasn't sure how much time we would have, so I just popped it into the chat here. But um, I wondered if uh, Dr. Easley had any insight into um, when we have trainings that might have um, not a positive tone or that some staff feel is not, um, doesn't have a positive tone. And it's for things, it often is things like, the concept of privilege. And just to be clear, I'm not asking about that concept. I just 
I'm not mm -hmm. sure how to approach an issue with our HR who are supposed to be like, you know, they know how to train people on this thing, but maybe mm -hmm. they're coming across the wrong way. If there's any tips on how to talk to other mm -hmm. kinds of groups like that. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll admit, I mean, I, I respect HR, human resources. Uh, we have a great HR office at uh, in my institute or in my school, we have a bigger one at the university. But I, I'll be honest, I'm gonna say something, and it's it is gonna sound a little jaded, you know, but I'm not trying to not be I'm not trying to upset people, but I am kind of telling what has been my truth from my experience. The moment I look at HR, I say you work for the organization, not necessarily for the people, but you work for the organization, you know. And so uh, you know, and so my uh, you know, so my thing is who are we protecting? when we're going and talking about this stuff, you know, like who, like, you know, are we really going to out various things that are going on or do we got to keep some things silent or quiet, so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, but that also depends on the place where you're working, who is there, but that is, but that is my opinion, but that's some experiences that I've had. So for me personally, like sometimes when it comes to some issues, if I need to get some solved, I don't necessarily go, go to, to HR. By the time I go to them, I probably have already solved it and got my lawyers on it already before I go to them. So that's just me and that's just my uh, position when it comes to that, you know, but I still respect everyone who works there because a lot of us all need a job or have to have a job. Okay, now the tips go on what to do. Well, one, when talking about privilege, one of the things that I encourage people to do, I was just talk, talking, um, just talking to my partner about this earlier. We were talking about cults. And somebody mailed something, uh, you know, something in, uh, um, uh, in my stepdaughter's in college, you know, so they sent it to, to her and it's something about a cold. And it's, it, it, we just looked at the cover and was like, what is this? Who sent this, you know, to them? And of course, we checked in with them. You see this? I don't want to trash it and then we threw it away. But then we started talking about cult, you know, in, cult, in culture. And one of the things that my partner did was uh, I'm part of a motorcycle club. So they talked about, you know, and, you know, that could be a cult, you know. Well, one part of them do was talk about the sorority that she's a member of. <laughs> so then after that, I was like, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Can you describe other examples of what a cult is? <laughs> and then she went and said, oh, yeah, sorority. Da, da, da. And I said, oh, OK, cool. OK, just OK. All right. So so you get it. So but the reason why I was going there is because normally when I'm teaching or trying to talk to people about something, I use I statements. So that's why I just kind of took you through that example and use I statements. One, if I'm going to talk about privilege or something that could be emotionally, racially, or a number of different ways charged, I try to figure out how to talk about it through me and through my lens, not to talk about it in a way that may make people feel like you're coming after me, you're accusing me of something, or you're blaming me. OK, now, even though you may be the perpetrator in the situation, but it's a lot easier to even speak to the perpetrator when you're speaking through islands, you know. So then can people like I'm getting ready to take a group uh, next week, uh, a school that I'm working with. I'm taking them through uh, through, a, um, through a DEI experience and I'm helping them understand, like, OK, OK, put like this. they want to know how do we help our black students? I'm like, oh, OK, and most of them are white. And then I go, okay, well then tell me how you identify. And then they got stuck. What do you mean? I'm like, well, how do you identify? I, I don't I don't know what you mean. And I was like, well, you just said we're helping our black students. So who and what are you? Why are they black? Besides what's on the on the application because how they look and why are they black. So when I say, so the reason why I was taking them through that and that led to us doing what we're doing next week is because I'm like, how can you help somebody if you can't even communicate about it? So that's the reason why I encourage people to speak through the islands, like know your privilege, know your identities, and then know some things about you that probably need to change or shift. Going back to one of my slides when I talk about why diversity fails, leadership's not a part of it. So you not being a part of it probably is a sign that you can't talk about it, which means that you're not doing something with it outside of work. So this is why I encourage people to do their own work. That will help you better communicate about something that's even charged because then you can speak about it in ways that it's either disarming to people or that is very informative where they're learning. And you can maybe even speak about it in a way where they can turn it around on themselves and start doing it. But if you just go in like this or go in that some say with guns blazing, that's what I mean when I say not victim blaming, but in a way you're contributing to the experience that you're having. Because let's say you don't like when people talk to you that way, but you just went in there and did it. See, so that's why I still encourage people to think about you know, the other person and the experience, even if you're the victim in the case, I still I still encourage people to do that. 
So I hope that's, that answers that some. Um, and if not, I can answer more because I, I have examples of how to deal with this. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Easley. I wonder, I don't know if there's any other questions, but I will just delay this one more time to ask a final question to bring us back to plants. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, um, what, what got you interested in forestry? Why did you go that route? You want the honest answer? Yeah. Money, scholarship, even though I'm an Eagle Scout. Even though I was raised gardening with my grandparents, I did. I had never heard of forestry before I got to college. I didn't know anything about it. So when I got a scholarship, um, now I feel bad a little bit, Patricia. There was another slide in my presentation that I skipped over. It was one where I had a rhyme on it, and that that slide would have told you like my living condition, like you know, unclean water, liquor stores, you know, no banks, good housing, can't afford all of that stuff. And the reason I would have walked people through that, because what I would want them, I would want to ask people, if you're getting people who come from this condition, do you really think they're thinking about this when they get to you? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like if I'm, if I come from an environment where my water's not clean, every time it rains, it floods, my grandparents are dying from cancer and all of this stuff, then when I get to this, to, to this, to this place, do they really think that I care about plants 100 percent they really think i care about biology like i'm like I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of things right now you know so that's also why i wanted to just kind of go you know like kind of add that slant to it because i wasn't thinking about forestry i was only thinking about surviving like i just needed a job i didn't know what kind of job i needed to get a degree so i can get a job and i go back to a grocery store where other people may say i went into forestry because my grandfather, my grandmother was a forester. I, I went into plants because I, I grew up, you know, doing it, you know, and just to encourage people, you know, everyone doesn't have that experience with it. So that means everyone's not going to approach it the same way. So like how I can kind of speak very, not indignantly, but toughly and passionately about forestry. Some people may think that means I don't like forestry. And I'm like, no, no, no. But I didn't enter into it like a lot of people. For me, forestry is a job, not a calling. This what I'm doing right here is a calling that deals with people, you know, but I am a good forester. I knew how to do it. I learned it. I got the skill. I'm certified, you know, but, you know, but I just have a different motivation. So, yeah. So I say scholarship. Here's a question. What, question, what kept me in forestry? The history and knowledge of my grandparents, being an Eagle Scout, not being afraid of the outdoors. And then when I really got comfortable that, oh, I know what I'm doing. And then that just kept going from there. That's fantastic. No, I think you can really bridge the gap between these it, worlds um, that might sometimes be separate. And just so that you know, I didn't know the word botany existed till I had to choose a degree in my sophomore year. And I was so excited that botany, I'm so glad it started with B because my sister started at the beginning of the program. And if it had been a zoologist, I'd have never gotten there. Um, <laughs> So yeah, we, we all come into this in a different way and I really appreciate you and I appreciate your um, your talk with us today, your insights, your helpful suggestions. And I think um, I, can, I can speak for all of us, even though I try not to speak for others. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that we all are so pleased that you were able to come speak to us today. And I just thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you everybody for being here and listening, tolerating me and all that good stuff. And thanks for your questions. And please, uh, I send, I'm going to send this current to this current version to Maggie. Okay, so Maggie, I still need to send you one so and then people can reach out to me if they like or, you know, have more questions or conversations with me. Yeah, fantastic. And you know, we, we have um, to close the call soon and I do want to get one more thing in for the rest of the participants, but didn't you say something about you wanted to let people know about some publication that was coming out? Would you like to yeah. include that uh, yeah. in the minutes or? I can just, no, I can say it real quick. The slide on there that says Mind Heart for Diversity and the presentation with y'all, which you all again, my book, my next book coming out is entitled Mind Heart for Diversity while walking through. I can matter of fact, some of the questions that were here, I walk you through how to do this. I walk you through how to have a conversation. I walk you through, but I walk you through my experience and I teach you through uh, not just forestry examples, but ministry examples, college examples, 
And then in the end of each chapter, there are questions for you to answer. And then at the end of the book, you have like a guide you can like start to apply. So it'll be, I don't know when it'll be out. Still waiting on the publisher to finish with that, but my part is done. Oh, fantastic. No, oh, that'll be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I hope you'll stay with us for the next few minutes while we try to give some other folks an opportunity to share updates. This is our, our Native Plants Roundtable where we okay. open it up to anyone who wants to talk about events, um, publications, whatnot. Now Brian's oh. hand is up. Well, can I mute myself and just mute my camera then? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Whatever makes you comfortable. Uh, Brian's hand is gone. Um, okay, Chris, did you want to make your announcement now? Um, yes, I can do that. Um, I'm Great. Chris Firestone with um, Pennsylvania DCNR Bureau of Forestry. Um, and Rebecca and Greg, if you're still on and feel like you want to. Um, weigh in on this, let me know. Um, but our agency does have a, um, a program, it's Pennsylvania Plant Conservation Network, which is Pennsylvania's um, PCA. And we have a position open to um, head that program within um, our agency. It is not a state job, it is with the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. And just a few minutes ago, I checked and it's not up on their website yet. Um, and that's Western Pennsylvania Conservancy under jobs. Um, it's not there yet, but um, Rebecca or Greg, you might know um, more about when it should be there. Yeah, this, this is Greg, um, Greg Podosinski. Uh Yeah, the job's actually been posted, I think in several places. Uh, today, I think it went up and I know it got forwarded to PCA because I saw a PCA notice. <laughs> um, so if it's not up, it should be up shortly. But there is an email address in the note and it's on a couple different job boards, some botany related job boards. But yeah, this would be our, our plant. This is the coordinator for our program. Um, and Chris is right. It's technically with the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, but it's actually embedded. The position's actually embedded in our department in the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation Natural Resources. And I did notice it's open till March 24th. So if you're interested or know anybody, please let them know. Yeah, we've definitely shared it widely and it did go over the list serves. Um, and so hopefully you'll get some really great candidates because um, we really enjoyed your last uh, coordinator and we hope you, we're sure you'll find another fantastic person. <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> I don't know if, if anyone else has um, updates. Please, you know, raise your hand or turn on your video. Um, however, to let me know, um, I, I would like to just mention one thing I heard. It's really disturbing. I don't have a link to share with you, but um, I've been hearing on some of my networks that um, there have been some uh, new stories of uh, resourceful thieves who are mining locality data to poach rare species. This specifically was going on in South Africa, um, but and it had something to do with some of the conservation assessments that are being made um, where locality data is made available in the process of um, assessing the status of the species. And so I think they're working on that issue, but this just rears its ugly head. It's 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 a constant issue I think that I've heard about in almost the entire time I've been at Fish and Wildlife Service, which has been almost 20 years of this um, issue of not being able to protect locality data when you are talking about um, natural resources that are rare or information that um, might be intellectual knowledge. Um, so just one more reminder out there to folks who, who sort of work in that arena who might be doing things um, involving that sort of um, information that um, it is still an issue and so be aware of it. Um, do we have any other do we have any announcements? From others on the line? There's nothing going on in native plants across the entire United States. OK, well, I've given the pregnant pause, which is one tip I was told. Oh, 
We've got a hand. Fantastic. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, uh, this is Chris Leslie. I'm uh, with uh, California Native Plant Society. Uh, had a question. We, we recently started an initiative to try to um, promote uh, native plant use in public works projects. Um, we're focused on California. And uh, just wondering if you guys have resources like uh, model ordinances from any state where um, e either local or state um, ordinances have been updated to try to prioritize native plants. Uh, I, I know there's a supply chain constraint, you know, so, sometimes certain things aren't available, but just if there's any examples that we could look at um, for lessons learned, that'd be great. If do we have any suggestions from folks on the line? Next, Nick Bernstein, Nick, you ready? Yeah. Good afternoon, or or uh, you, you don't have to answer right now, but maybe I'll uh, post a question in the Facebook page or something. Uh, yeah, I was going to uh, suggest actually too onto our list serve. Um, you'd be surprised at who's on those lists and um, I kind of have some ideas for some local ordinances, but those are more of the um, and, and that might be helpful and I can post share that with you. Um, and this is more along the lines of people, homeowners associations that have rules that you have to keep a lawn mode. So it presumes that a you have a lawn um, and two that you know that you want to mow it. So um, someone's native plant garden uh, had been mowed down for them uh, while they were out of town once. And so now there's an ordinance in this in Maryland um, in one of these counties. Um, but I'm not sure if that hits at what you're looking for, but I would totally suggest that you do. Um, someone's posting something on our chat too, um, that you post it to our native plant listserv. Oh, OK, great. Yeah, and I see a couple links here too that looks useful. Thanks. Yeah. And if you don't know about the listserv, just feel free to contact me and we'll get you hooked up. Thanks. Um, OK, so I will just say I'd like to tell you all that our next meeting is going to be on May 12th. Uh, we'll have a couple of folks. In fact, someone who was on the line today, Dr. Stephanie Green and Dr. Brian Irish from the Agricultural Research Service that who will be talking about their role in native plant uh, germplasm conservation. And um, as always, of course, we will we'll post information about that and, and reminders over our listservs. And so we hope that you will um, subscribe to our lists. I want to thank again our fantastic speaker and as well as all of you who joined us today. Um, Dr. Easley. Thank you so much for coming to visit us for today. And you know, maybe, maybe we'll see you again. Okay. Thank you. All right, everyone, take care. Uh, do your good work, and we'll see you again in May. Bye bye.